<clears throat> Assalamu alaikum and a very warm welcome to all the students. I welcome you all on behalf of ACCA to the third day of practice to pass webinar for advanced taxation exam. This is your tutor Saad Muhammad. Can everybody raise their hand if they can hear me clearly and see my screen as well? Thank you. Okay, guys, so as you are aware that this is our third session. And today also I have selected the question for you that deals with multiple taxation. However, for today I have selected 225 mark questions to go through with you because as you know the pattern of the paper that there'll be 135 mark question 125 mark question which are as compared to the section B question a bit lengthier and their requirements are a bit in detail and you examiner has a wider area to test your knowledge in those parts. So those questions are comparatively lengthy as compared to the section B and as the exam is CBE from now onwards you may struggle to manage your time while solving the section A questions. So today I have selected from section a question 25 mark questions and for tomorrow i have selected 35 mark questions and on the last day we'll be discussing again the questions that deal with multiple taxes so without wasting any time let's start and for those who have joined today <coughs> for the first time guys my name is mia saad muhammad and i am member of acc and my Key areas are advanced taxation and advanced audit. I'm the tutor at one of the gold approved learning partner LGS defense international degree program. <clears throat> so let's start and guys as you're well aware that I am using the practice platform of ACCA to teach you guys as to how you should use the CBE platform because the exams will be CBE. However, can I ask you guys to raise your hand for who have received the email from ACCA regarding the remote invigilation exam. Okay, there are a few students who have received. So guys, it is still unsure that whether the exams will be taking place at the <clears throat> exam centers or the remote invigilation will be in place. However, I hope so that we'll came to learn shortly as <clears throat> due to pandemic in different parts of the world, the situation is different. So guys, let's discuss that. What is our today's plan? As far as the questions are concerned. In the handout section, you can find the day wise question plan as well as my notes. For the third day, the question that I have selected is a D from September 18 attempt that primarily deals with individual taxation issues. However, the second question that I have selected is plaid and quill limited. Because normally what I have seen is the higher amount of past paper weightage is towards CT plus VAT question when it comes to question number two. So usually the examiner likes to test the 25 mark question on CT plus VAT. However, he sometimes tests the question number two on individual taxation as well. And guys, do remember I have kept telling this thing in my webinars that there will be a five mark ethical part in either the question number 25 or the question number 35 and I'll today one of the question has that five mark part when I'll be teaching that I'll tell you that where in my notes you can find the ethics section completely and how will it help you to take five marks for sure why because the ethical part of the exam is not only you can expect that it must be present in your exam, but it is of repetitive nature. The examiner keep asking the same type of questions. So if you have thoroughly read the answer of the past exam papers, the exam question 
will most probably of a repetitive nature for which the students that have thoroughly read the answer the past paper it will be very easy to answer so guys before i start the question if anybody has the question they can ask me any questions before i start okay then please raise your hand to give me a go ahead so that i can start thank you so guys as always i'll open the practice platform but before that many students do ask me that sir we can we find the recording of the lectures first of all do remember that the recording is normally available after 24 hours however i'll take you to through the process where you can find the recording on acca vimeo channel so all you have to do is you have to go to the google and write practice to pass acca once you'll write that click on the first link and then the website will open on the bottom right corner you can see that there is a link called practice to pass recorded lecture and tutor handouts you just have to click on that a pdf file will be downloaded click on that pdf file and it will open the file in which you can find the lecture for all of the syllabus however to find the latest lecture click any of the link it will take you to the vimeo website of acca channel once the website is open you can click on the channel name acca pakistan and there you can find the videos available and you can see that my webinars are available here this is i guess the yesterday's lecture or the first day these are taxation webinars as well as advanced taxation webinars so quickly raise your hand if you have understood where you can find the lectures okay however do remember you have to wait for 24 hours at least so that acc can upload the lectures Okay, let's back to the practice platform. You know how to log in in the practice platform. I have taught you that in the day one and day two lectures. Here, I have already assigned myself all of the exams. And for D, I have to click on September 18 exam. So I'll go to home. And there it is before i start let me tell you one more thing because the student kept asking this you have seen that there are papers here you can see for example this is the december 2020 exam if i click on this resume i navigate to the last question i then press next and on this tab where i it tells me to review my questions I'll end the exam. After ending the exam, it will transfer to the mark section. So I'll click on mark. Here in ATX UK exam, I can find that December 2020 exam is there for self mark. I click on that. There it is showing you the answer itself however if you want to see the answer it is not showing you you can click here question sample answer click here to see the sample answer click here the answer will open drag this tab you can zoom in you can scroll down you can do whatever you want to with your answers so the student kept asking me sir how can i find the answers to the practice platform question so there you go now Let's back to the question. Click, I'll click on home. Go to my ATX UK pass exams. There I have September 18 exam. 
as it is a 25 mark question so obviously it will be a question number two in the attempt there you see your manager has forwarded a schedule of to you from d a new client of your firm the schedule and an email from your manager detailing the work he requires you to do are set out in the exhibits the following exhibits available on the left hand side of the screen provide information relevant to the question so i have two schedules in which i can find the information that is relevant so let's read the requirements quickly a deals with minimizing income tax on investment income b deals with some gift to cam i don't know who cam is and c is about tax efficient investments okay let's cross this and open email from my manager now do remember guys that for question number one and question number two the requirements will be scattered you can find find the requirement in two ways if you click on the requirement it will give you just the marking scheme that part a deals with 11 marks part b has nine marks part c has five marks okay it will just tell you this however to know that what has been asked in the requirements you have to click email from your manager in this you will came to learn that what your manager has asked you so this is the asking of a manager minimizing income tax on investment when carrying out the work you should assume these three points i have to assume and then this bullet points are which you can, with which you can see a dash these are my requirements when i have to answer i have to make sure that i answer for every bullet point this is one bullet point till here then this is the second bullet point whatever it is and then there is the third one then it's requirement b and when i'll be requirement uh, uh, answering the requirement b i have to remember that i should answer two bullet points one is still here and the one is still here then i have the requirement c so do remember whenever you are answering question number one or question number two there the requirement will be scattered into two parts one will just tell you the marking scheme one will tell you the detailed requirements in that always look for the bullet points and whenever you are answering always refer to the email from manager and check that have you answered all the bullet points in order to score good marks okay now let's get back to the question I will leave the assumptions for the time being because that I'll only be understand if I'll read the question. I'll just have a skim through of requirement. Calculations of the income tax saving which would be achieved in a complete tax year if D were to follow her friend's advice and give 150,000 of the proceeds from the sale to the London house to CAM in accordance with alternative investment plan. So, okay, there's some D. His friend has advised him something regarding the proceeds of London House. I do not know who the London House is that he should give the proceeds to CAM. I do not know at the time that who the CAM is. But I'm trying to take an idea that what the question would have related. Proceeds may tell me that it may relate to CGT. To do this efficiently, you should just calculate the additional tax payable by D and CAM on the income generated from inherited funds. So there may be inheritance tax parts. However, there is income tax for sure because I have to calculate the additional tax payable. Rather than preparing the complete income tax computation. So I just have to calculate the incremental part. I do not have to produce complete income tax computations. Then just have a quick go through of second bullet point. It seems to me that the total income liability of D and C could be reduced further. List retaining some fundamentals of D's alternative plan. Okay, the second part deals with some sort of a plan as well. And the third bullet point is the matter to be considered in relation to the proposed gift of 20,000 to order. So there's a third character called order as well. However, I have any idea that there are around three characters 
B cam order and they are trying to figure out something regarding inheritance funds and the house. Now I will read the question for the first time with few things in my mind. Okay. So now I'll click the schedules from D. Do remember that for part for section A, question number one, that is for 35 mark and question number two, they take considerable amount of time, not only in getting solved, but you also need a good amount of time to read through as well. So do remember that for question number one, I'll suggest you to use your reading and planning time. That is 15 marks. And for question number two, at least spend 10 to 12 minutes to go through the question because the better the you read the question, the more chances that you'll be able to answer it in an efficient way. So reading skills are very much critical to your success in the strategic professional exams, especially the optional ones. OK, now I am a resident in domiciled in the UK, my husband Cam. So now I know that Cam is husband of D moved to the UK in January 2016. Do remember that the D is resident and domiciled in the UK, but Cam has moved to UK. I do not know whether he is resident or domiciled now. Cam is resident in the UK. Okay, that's good, but domiciled in the country of Riveria. Now do remember that if they ask me about resident status, I have to make sure that cam is domiciled uh, resident, but not domiciled. However, D is not only resident, but domiciled as well. I have a 16 year old son Oder, who is resident and domiciled in the UK. Okay, now I got it that Oder is the son of cam uh, son of cam and D. My father's London house. Okay, what I remember that this may relates to requirement A in which they were talking about some house. My father died on 1st June 2021. So they he died in our tax year. It is important. And I inherited his London house. The house had a value for probate purposes of 390,000. Now, what do we mean by probate? Probate means the market value at death. And whenever you inherit something, you have to pay the IHT if they, it does not qualify for any relief. However, here it is unclear whether it qualified for any relief or not, or whether she paid any IHT on that or not. But do remember one thing that D will be perceived to inherited the house at the probate value. So probate value will be cost for D for now onwards. If at any given time in the future D decides to sell the house, this will be her cost. That is 390,000. So any increase in the value from 390,000 will subject to CGT only. Till 390 only IHT will be payable if any. Okay, so the house had the probate value for the uh, probate uh, value for the probate purposes of 390,000, but is now worth 450. Okay, my father purchased the house for 130,000 in 1987. That doesn't really matter. I intend to sell the house as soon as possible. So now I know that she is planning to sell the house. So I have to tell her if the requirement ask at any particular point that the gain that will be attributable to CGT will be the difference between the probate value that is 390 and the market value that is 450. So around 60,000 pounds will be subject to capital gains tax. Now before I read the question further, did you guys get an idea as to how to read the question when it comes to section A? Raise your hand and let me know. Okay, so you are getting an idea how to read the question. Okay, moving on. Investment plan in respect of the proceeds from the sale of the London house. I plan to invest the 450 proceeds as follows. So she is now telling me what is her plan as to how 
she invests wants to invest this 450 300 thousand pounds purchase of uk shares and 150 cash deposit in the uk okay alternative investment plan okay i have heard this word alternative investment plan while i was reading the requirement so i know that this is relevant to the requirement as well it has been suggested to me by a friend who is a tax advisor that i should consider an alternative investment plan which would result in lower income tax liability for me and my family under my friend's suggestion i would give 150000 of the sale proceeds from the london house to cam that is her husband leaving me with 300000 we would then each invest two thirds of our respective funds in shares with the remaining third left on the cash deposit so what they are planning is that they should first split this 450 between husband and wife 150 with cam and 300 with d now both of them will then reinvest their proceeds as two thirds of their proceeds into the shares and one third into the cash rather than d investing herself all of the proceeds so i will what i'll be doing is that i'll take two third of 300 ones and two third of 150 ones to see how much each will invest in shares and one third of 300 ones and one third of 150 ones to calculate how much each will invest in cash deposits i would like to know what the income tax savings would be if i followed my friend's advice rather than my original plan for that i need some other information regarding cam and d for example which band pair are they what is their level of income so things like that i'll be needing to suggest them that whether this strategy will help them or not now let me zoom the question a little bit for you so you can clearly see that what i'm trying to tell guys is it better raise your hand and let me know is it more visible now the question thank you okay moving on if you click on this print sign you can save this question as a pdf as well here you can see you can save it as a pdf as well the complete question if you want to revise any time later for example i can save this into my computer as test q and then i can later on open from there and open the spreadsheet side by side and then solve the question there as well however i told you how you can access the answers now i will suggest to you that if you have a paper and pen while you are reading the question try to make notes along with that if you do not have paper or pen in the exam then open the scratch pad and try to make your notes there as well if you remember in the last two days every time i'm reading a question i open my scratch pad and make my notes there so it is always a better approach because there is a lot of information which you have to process at once a lot of information there is a chance that you may skip some but always better that while you are reading question number one or question number two make notes along with that to make the connection of the question scenario with the requirement so before moving on i'll open my scratch pad until now what i came to learn is that there are 450000 of proceeds they are planning to split in 150k to cam 300k to d okay and then further one third into cash and two third into share there i'll just write 
same these are my notes till now because it is a lot of information to process at once so it's better that i make my bullet points so it becomes easier for me to process the information now investment plan in respect of the proceeds from the sale of london house that i know already and we have read till here i would like you to know the tax savings okay gift to order yes this was one of the parts as well of the requirement a i am also considering making a cash gift of 20000 20000 out of my existing funds not from the proceeds from the sale of london house okay so this 20000 does not has to do anything with those proceeds or order would <coughs> place this amount on cash deposit now i do not know what is the exact requirement because i have not gone through the detailed requirement in full but one thing i know that as far as the CGT is concerned, cash gifts are exempt from CGT. So if she makes a cash gift to her son, it will be exempt from CGT scope. If I talk about inheritance tax, no asset is exempt in inheritance tax. Only the parties can be exempt, and two only two parties are exempt: wife and charity. Otherwise, you can you may be able to get away from IST by the help of a relief, but there is no as such exemption available so in IHT this will be treated as a pet and if D manages to live more than seven years it will become exempt otherwise her son order might have to pay that IHT if she were to die in any time soon so I just you know have made a map in my mind that if it are if the requirement are, will ask about CGT I will write this if income tax I can write that so in my scratch pad I can go and write 20k cash gift to son now coming back our annual income I set out below our current annual income okay if I'll have the idea of their annual income I'll be able to suggest them that whether it will be beneficial for them to split the income and then invest depending upon their income levels the bank interest and dividends are in respect of the cash deposits and all of which are held in ISAs we invest the maximum possible amount into ISA on 1st May each year so guys I'll stop here and I'll ask you guys that I know that ISA's account in which you can deposit cash as well as your shares as well so on shares whatever the dividend will come it will come directly into your isa account and it will be exempt the cash will be and the interest you will receive on the cash from the account that would be exempt too so any return from isa is exempt but i would like to ask you that what is the limit of isa tell me in the question section Thank you, Tariq. It is 20,000. Rubina, you have asked, wouldn't it be better to write a word processor? The word processor is to write your answers, your proper answers. The scratch pad is for you like a rough paper. So obviously, I am noting my or uh, noting down my review points while reading the question. So it's better to use a scratch pad, not the word processor. I hope it answers your question. now getting back to the question order has no income none of us have made any previous chargeable gains so that is a very important point it means that if there will be any cgt question or cgt calculation i can deduct all of the annual exemptions because they have not made any previous chargeable gains so full annual exemption available i'll quickly go to my scratch pad and write that full a a stands for annual exemption of cgt available okay coming back employment income d has 170000 and she might not even getting the personal allowance as well on that high level of income because obviously if you cross 125000 threshold of an income unless you until you make 
significant amount of personal pension contributions of good or gifted donation you are unable to and get any personal allowance you are not entitled to any of the personal allowance okay so employment income of 170000 fd and for cam 18000 so there's a drastic difference a d is seem to be an additional rate band payer because her income is even exceeding 150000 limit only if i see a employment income in isolation i haven't considered the rest of the income and to cam if i look at it he is a basic rate band taxpayer so there is a lot of difference and if i call back what their friend who is a tax advisor advised them i guess he was right she should transfer a good amount of money to cam because if cam transfer and whatever the return that uh, investment gives back cam will have a lower tax rate so the couple has to pay the lower tax rate if cam made the investments okay so employment income is 170 and 18 then they have a bank interest from isa and dividends from isa so they will not be considered as part of their income anyways because it is exempt the bank interest as well as the dividends so guys i have to ask you a question here the dividends from isa are exempt that i get it but do they consume your 2000 nil rate band of dividends as well or they don't thank you Tarek and rubina you guys are right as they are exempt they are not taxable so why will they use the nil rate band so yes they do not so we have our dividend nil rate band available as well tax efficient investments so before reading that let me go to the scratch pad and write here that d 45 percent taxpayer cam 20 percent taxpayer so it will become easier for me to process that lot of information now i have seen so many students struggling in question number one what they do is they read the question first they then read the requirement they then read the question again and still they are nowhere to find the correct answer so you guys tell me how many of you struggle while solving the question number one and question number two by raising your hands how many of you struggle okay i guess this approach will help you in collecting or processing information now tax efficient investments there was a separate requirement for them i have considered investing in eis shares but have not done so due to high level of risk involved because eis are normally new companies if you remember i'll take you to my notes after reading the requirements that what eis are and what vcts are EIS are normally new companies and that is why HMRC has given taxpayers certain advantages because taxpayers are normally reluctant to invest in new companies because as they are new companies they do not have that much of experience if their product or service will not be successful in the market the shareholders will lose their money so to encourage shareholders to take the risk HMRC on such small companies have provided certain tax advantages which i'll be discussing later okay so she's reluctant to invest in eis because of the risk level however understand that venture capitalist trust vcts have a lower level of risk <coughs> why vcts have a lower level of risk because vctrs are large quoted companies whose job is to invest in companies vcts are the companies who have the expertise that they know that who are the companies who have the right potential but they are struggling with money so what they do is they are also known as angel investors they go they rescue them by investing in them and in return they buy stake or holding or ownership in those companies which companies small companies who are struggling financially but they have a potential in them 
they buy those companies provide them the relevant amount of money give them their expertise as to how they can succeed in the market and when the company actually gets successful they sell their holding at a very good price which they have bought for very low price in the first instance make good profit and then start to look for another money so vcds are like that guys if you do not know where to invest the money you invest the money into us and we know where to invest the money these these are what you call vcds so government promote these type of companies as well the government wants to promote or hmrc wants to promote that people should invest in vct so that if vcts have a good amount of money they will then invest in the companies who have a good potential and in this way the economy overall will prosper so that is the rationale behind a of hmrc you know a promoting eis and vcts now please let me know or please let me have a comparison of the income tax implications of these two forms of investment on the assumption that i will invest 50000 in the tax year 2021 2022 i do not know for how long i want to hold these shares okay so for that i have to revise the eis and vct from my notes to check that what are the tax advantages and is there any holding period restriction on them to have their advantages or utilize their advantages so we have to check that later on now the question is finished so what i'll do is on my scratch pad i'll just write that tell d e i s versus vct advantages now my scratch pad along with the detailed requirement will help me to process the information from the question so let's open the requirements again the detailed one sorry minimizing income tax on investment income when carrying out this work you should assume the shares purchased will yield a 4% return per annum and the cash deposits will yield a 1% return per annum okay the whole of the 450 will be available to invest d will pay any capital gains tax due in respect of the sale of the london house out of our existing funds so we don't have to do that after tax proceeds things that we first have to check that how many after tax proceeds do we have and then we'll invest those after tax proceeds so we don't we have we do not have to do that bit otherwise in most of the question he always ask me to first calculate the after tax proceeds that will be available to invest and then he ask me about the aspects of investment okay none of the investments will consist of eis or vct okay so out of that 350 they will not be in investing in eis or vct i guess for that d has paid the separate 50000 which he has told us in the last part calculations of the income tax savings which would be achieved in a complete tax year if d were to follow her friend's advice and give 150000 of the proceeds from the sale of the london house to cam in accordance with the alternative investment plan okay guys so we have to calculate that what will be the tax savings that if d rather than investing all of the 450 herself out of that transfer 150 to cam and then they both will invest as per their in friend's advice who is a tax advisor as well but guys i'll stop here and ask you guys that will there be any tax implication of either cgt or igt when the d will transfer 150 to cam will there be any the reason being guys because they are spouse in inheritance tax and in capital gains tax in both taxes they are exempt however do remember that cam is not a uk resident and domiciled spouse 
if your spouse is only resident but not domiciled in the UK you have to remember that you do not have unlimited amount available to transfer things to your husband you have a cap equivalent to the nil rate band amount that is 325000 the nil rate band is separate do not mix it up with that however it has the same amount as well that if your husband is a non domiciled despite of he being a uk resident if he is a non uk domiciled you can transfer him anything up to 325000 there will be no iht any amount above 325000 there will be iht but if your husband or wife or your spouse is a uk domiciled partner there is unlimited amount available there is no cap so these are the things that you have to keep in your mind i'll take you to my notes to tell you that way you can find this information in cgt the there is no restriction of the resident status rubina so in cgt your domicile does not matter if you're a spouse civil partner that's fine now I'll take you to my notes in there the first chapter is inheritance tax and in there the last heading is the overseas aspects of IHT in that overseas aspects of IHT you can see there that if your there is a thing called deemed domiciled what is deemed domiciled the deemed domicile mean deemed means assumption so if your spouse is not a UK domiciled and they want to become UK domiciled for the IHT purposes only HMRC allows them that they can claim the domicile from HMRC which they call deemed domicile that is for H IHT's perspective HMRC will assume that they are UK domiciled now what will be the advantage of that the advantage will obviously be that your 325,000 limit cap will be gone and your limited will now be your limit will now be unlimited for the IHT transfers Is there any disadvantage? Yes, there is now all of your worldwide assets are subject to IHT if you are only a UK resident, but not domiciled in the UK Only the assets in the UK are subject to IHT if you take domicile as well then your worldwide assets become taxable or chargeable to inheritance tax so these are the points that you should remember now let's get back into the question to do this efficiently you should just calculate the additional tax payable by D and CAM on the income generated by the inheritance funds. So to calculate the income, it is pretty easy. I'll take their investment, multiply by 4% for shares and multiply by 1% for cash. And whatever my answer is for CAM, I'll straight away apply the rate 20%. And if at any point of time, he will exceed the basic rate band. I'll then apply 40%. But for Cam, it is pretty easy that she is an additional rate band pair. So I'll apply 45% of any of the income that she'll be earning from this inherited funds. To save you time, I have already calculated that if D invests the whole of the 450 herself, she would incur an additional income tax liability of in respect of the bank and trust and their dividend income of a complete tax year of 4845 okay guys so the examiner already made job pretty easy for me that he has told me the answer of one option that is d investing all of the 450 herself now all i have to do is i have to calculate the second option answer and then compare it with the first one that is 4485 now i'll open my scratch pad and i'll write there about this that for part a first option tax equals to four four eight five and I'll write here calculate 
only second just for myself now it seems to me that total income tax liability of d and cam could be reduced further list still retaining the fundamentals of d's alternative investment plan d would still give cam 150000 but rather than each of them investing two third of their funds in shares and leaving the remainder on cash deposits would be split between them in a different way set out the factors which are relevant to obtaining a more income tax efficient split of the total investment you should only consider the income of tax positions of d and cam and the nature of the proposed investment now you know my manager who has sent me the email thinks that that is fine the there should be some amount that needs to be transferred to cam this will help the couple to save their tax however he says that i do not think that there should be two-third of the amount to be transferred to d and one-third should be transferred to cam rather some other split should be made and he asked me that i shall look at the scenario and i should suggest that what should be the better split or the what should be the better decision or the criteria of the split i do not require you to produce calculations that is a blessing that i do not have to produce calculations i just have to write of any potential tax savings the matters to be considered i will highlight this just so that i can remember that i do not have to produce calculations the matters to be considered in addition to income tax in respect of the proposed gift to order gift to cam by reference to cam's domicile explain why d's proposed gift of 50000 to cam could result in inheritance like tax liability and how this potential liability might be avoided you should note that d gave cam a half interest in her home on 1st august 27 obviously that is not the london house because the london house has just received this tax year it must be some other home which has been given to cam on 1st august 2017 and the value what of that gift was 600000 so guys if she has already given something to her husband that is above 325000 don't you think that they have already used the 325 exemption that is available to non uk domiciled spouses what do you think guys thank you bella that is right they have now they have also asked me that is there any way that they can avoid that i have just told you by referring to my notes that, that yes there is a way what is that way guys Tarek not a joint election a deemed domicile no 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 Bella the deed of variation is different deed of variation means changing the will The correct answer will be don't deem yes elect to be deemed domiciled thank you hannes you're right the correct answer will be the deemed domicile that they must elect with hmrc however i'll tell them that the advantage of that that their limit will become unlimited there will be no cap now but worldwide assets of cam will subject to ist so if he has any assets in the Riveria country of Riveria there those assets will subject to CGT as well uh, Tarek you have asked that will there be a split working no even if they jointly like to split accordingly the thing is Tarek that there the limit has been exceeded if d were to die in each, uh, in in you know uh, near future cam has to pay ist on that okay now 
let's get back to the question guys so for that i can answer them that for b the as the d is sorry as the cam is a non uk domiciled spouse for her or for him the limit of the hmrc is 325000 so if they do not elect with hmrc for a deemed domicile for in a way that they can reduce or they can you know elect for the hmrc for this domicile they have to pay the inheritance tax but if they elect with hmrc as a deemed domicile the benefit of that will be that there will be low limit cap on cam but his worldwide assets will be chargeable so i guess only this will be ample as far as the b part is concerned for the first bit now in the second bit he has asked me for the calculations in order to show the capital gains tax savings which would be achieved if d were to give cam one third interest in the london house prior to sale as opposed to cash of 150 following its sale so rather than that d first sell the house and whatever money has received she then out of that money give 150 to cam the examiner is asking me wouldn't it be better that even if before selling the house they jointly elect and one third ownership should be transferred to cam two third transfer to d and then they sell the house and then the gain will split accordingly as well they both have to pay the tax because before only d was selling the house so the cam does not have to pay the tax only d has to pay the tax but now if they make a claim of jointly splitting the gain they both have to pay the cgt but in my opinion it will be lower as compared to if d only pays it and there are multiple reasons of that if you remember guys while i was reading the question i have clearly seen that both of them have not disposed any of the asset which means there were two annual exemptions available if d were to sell the house herself she will be able to deduct only one annual, annual exemption and cam's annual exemption will go wasted however if she split the gain with him there will be two annual exemptions due to which the gain will automatically be lower and although cam has to pay the tax on the higher rate but i believe that for d i have seen that some of his basic rate band was left but if we assume that the basic rate band will be consumed by the income tax incomes still the tax will be lower because there will be two annual exemptions due to the availability of two annual exemptions. So guys, whenever you are reading a question of ATX exam, you should think yourself as a consultant and you should think that a client has come to me and he thinks that, you know, I have studied ATX notes and books and I know that how the UK tax system works. So can I help him? And I can, can I, you know, using my knowledge, save his tax? If you think in that way only this way you start to generate ideas the why don't you do this if you do this it will help you with this if you use this if you give him this in this way you'll try to think like that now I'll open my scratch pad and I'll write here that for B what do I have to do So scratch pad I'll write here that for B do remember that tell about deemed domiciled calculate CGT assuming split use two annual exemptions that's I have made a note for myself. So when I'll be reading the question again because it is too much information to process at once 
I need to have some bullet points for myself so I can remember that when I was reading a question on the requirement for the very first time what was my review points okay so lastly I have to deal with the last requirement a comparison of the income tax implications for D of investing 50,000 in either EIS shares or VCT shares as requested guys if I am at you know doing a question what my normal policy is that I shall approach the questions that have a straightforward implication for which I do not have to read the whole question again and again I have to find figures what happened there what happened there if there is a part that I can attempt in isolation by reading just a one two paragraph from the question I'll prefer to attempt that first so do you guys agree with me that rather than solving the first two parts we shall solve the C part first because in that we just have to tell the advantages raise your hand if you agree with me okay guys so let's quickly revise VCT and EIS implications in my notes there is a separate section for tax efficient investment schemes in the income tax I'll take you there that is tax efficient investments in that you can find ISA it is a tax efficient investment scheme as I told you that you are a consultant you should remember that if your client comes to you and ask that look I have that amount of money can you please let me know what are the schemes in which I can invest and save my tax these are the schemes that you should tell him or suggest one is ISA but the problem with ISA is that it is it has a cap of 20,000 on the account so what if if someone has more than 20,000 or they have already utilized their ISA for example in this question D and CAM have already utilized their ISA so then you should think for other schemes like EIS VCT SEIS these are some other schemes that you should think now here you can find that I have summarized that what is the advantage and what is the criteria of EIS I have not only summarized but I have also told that what are the certain advantages of EIS in income tax in CGT and in inheritance tax so I have summed that here as well now if you invest in EIS whatever the amount you invest HMRC will refund you 30 percent amount of that how will HMRC will refund you they're not going to give you the cash back rather whatever your tax liability is you can deduct that amount from there for example my tax liability this year is 40,000 however I have invested 10,000 in qualifying EIS shares so 30 percent of that will be 3,000 so out of my 40,000 liability 3,000 will be deducted by HMRC and I can claim that 3,000 reduction and shall pay 37,000 as a tax however HMRC has provided a cap on that for a year that you cannot invest more than 1 million per annum you can invest 3 million in three different years but you cannot invest 1 million more than 1 million per annum so the max tax reducer that you can take is 300,000 that is 30 percent of the 1 million in one year you can deduct it from your income tax liability but a very 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 important point it cannot ref create a refund it can reduce your tax liability to nil for example if I have a tax liability of 10,000 and my EIS deduction answer is 12,000 I'll not be getting a 2000 refund by HMRC so guys what is the sensible approach before investing in my my money in EIS or SEIS or VCT isn't it you know handy that I shall calculate my estimated tax liability before what do you suggest in many questions you will see that the examiner asks you that you have a client and the client wants you to know that how much money shall he invest in the EIS and SEIS and if you go through the solution you'll came to learn that you first have to calculate their income tax liability obviously the estimated one and you then suggest him or her 
that look this is this will be your expected income tax liability you should avoid investing such amount that the 30 percent of which or the reducer answer of which shall exceed your tax liability because you will not be able to get a refund but is there any hope yes there is an investor may elect to carry back the amount invested for previous one year only but cannot get relief on more than 1 million in any one tax year so if there is any amount left you can deduct that amount from your previous year's tax liability okay so in that way your previous year's tax liability will be reduced hmrc will still not going to give you the refund however or the money that now hmrc owes you will be adjusted against your future tax liabilities so hmrc is quite reluctant to giving you the money out of their pocket how are they quite efficient to take out the money from your pocket? But that's how it is. Now, what about the income from the EIS? Obviously, what you have purchased is the shares in EIS company. So obviously, the return from the shares is always in the form of dividends. So the dividends from EIS are taxable in a normal way. However, you get the reducer for the very first time when you do invest in them. The income tax relief is withdrawn if the shares are not held for the minimum period of three years so guys i remember that in the question d told me that she's unsure how long will she hold the shares so i'll be specifically telling her that you hold, you have to hold the shares for three years if you invest in eis otherwise the relief must be paid back to the HMRC. You have to pay back the relief to HMRC. And how will you pay back? In the following year, you will add the same amount of reducer and your tax liability. If you have not sell the shares completely, for example, I have owned 10,000 shares. Uh, in, I have bought 10,000 shares in the EIS. After two years, I sell 5,000 of, out of them. So I do not have to return the complete reducer. I have to return the 50% reducer that I claimed two years back. The 50 percent i can take or keep now what about cgt in cgt the capital gains on the disposal of the qualifying shares are exempted again provided if they if you keep keep them for three years so i will suggest d that if she wants to invest in eis she should hold the shares for three years in this way not only she will not have to return the reducer back to HMRC, that is the income tax reducer. Also, if she will sell the shares, she will not have to pay any capital gains tax as well. So she must hold the shares for 3S if she were to invest in EIS. We'll talk about VCT later. But capital losses are allowable. So if the shares are loss making, then HMRC does not bound you to hold them for three years. You can sell them whenever you want to and you can claim the loss as well even if you sell them before three years eis deferral relief is available now what is eis deferral relief eis deferral relief means that if you have sale anything you can find the eis deferral relief in detail in my notes in the cgt section as well There you can see EIS deferral relief, but I'll quickly go through EIS deferral relief means if you sell anything and whatever the proceeds you receive from there, if you do not keep, if you do not put it into your pocket, rather you invest the, these proceeds in, to buy qualifying EIS shares, HMRC will not charge you capital gains tax on that proceeds or gain. HMRC will defer your gain. It will not be exempted. It will def it will be deferred. What does it mean? For example, if I sell something and I realized 30% 30 30,000 gain on that I am a high rate band payer So it means that if it is not a residential property, I have to pay 20% tax on that which will be around 6,000 But what I do is I invest all of the proceeds that I have received to buy EIS shares the HMRC will defer my 6,000 gain and Whenever I will sell the shares 
on that day that old frozen 6000 gain will become chargeable so you have another relief available that if you invest by selling something in eis your gains get deferred election can be made for capital losses arising on eis to relieve against total income now eis is the only shares on which if you receive a loss you can relieve your loss against your total income total income means the income that are subject to income tax and the income that are subject to capital gains tax otherwise whenever you sell an asset if you have suffered loss on that it is considered as a capital loss it can never be adjusted against income tax incomes only it the relief is available for eis YHMRC does not allow you to deduct any capital losses against income tax incomes because in income tax the rates are higher HMRC know that if you relieve your losses against income tax incomes You will have a higher amount of savings, but for only EIS shares HMRC has such gracious terms or generous terms now in inheritance tax EIS shares qualify for BPR as well if you hold them for two years so guys it is one of the best investments if you buy them and you can keep them for three years because if you buy them immediately you'll get a tax reducer and income tax when you'll sell them if you sell them after three years there'll be no cgt if you keep them for two years and do not sell it rather transfer it there'll be no iht so you are covered from every perspect however there is only one drawback that the dividend from the EIS shares is taxable. That is the only drawback. So let's compare it with VCT. VCT has a simple mechanism and similar mechanism as well. If you invest in VCT, you'll get the 30% reducer as well. But the maximum amount that you can invest is much lower than EIS. It is only 200,000. Okay. You can invest more, but you will not be getting any income tax reducer. So in one year you can invest maximum 20,000, which means 20,000 times 30% 60,000 is the maximum amount of tax reducer one can get Again, the reducer can reduce their liability cannot create a refund So it is always wise to look your tax liability first before deciding how much you want to invest There is no carry back facility in VCT in EIS if you have invested more you can carry back the reducer for one year in vct it is not available but a very good feature of vct is that the dividend that you receive from vct are also exempt from income tax so when you invest immediately you receive a 30 percent reducer and whenever you receive a refund the dividend income will also be exempt whenever you receive a dividend it will be exempt from income tax as well now but the conditions are much stricter for them. You have to hold the shares for five years. If you sell the shares before five years, you have to return the reducer. In capital gains tax, the disposal of CG VCT is also exempt. There is no relief for capital losses because there is very low chances that your VCT shares will be sold at a loss. So that's why there is no loss relief available. No deferral relief available as well because it is not a risky investment. However, in VCT, they do not qualify for BPR. So every every relief has their own advantages. I prefer VCT more because the duration till you hold them, you do not have to pay any income tax on the dividends. So coming back to the question, what I'll be telling D is that I'll be telling her because there are not that much marks available. So I'll not discuss in that much detail if I quickly look at how many marks are available There are five marks available. So I'll just you know tell her the key points The first thing is that there'll be a 30% tax reducer available Regardless of if you invest in the VCT or the EIS Second the share disposal of both will be exempt but for CGT, but for EIS, you have to hold the shares for three years and for VCT, you have to hold the share for five years. And for losses, 
EIS losses can be claimed whenever you want to sell them, but for VCT, no relief is available. So these are the key points, and then I can tell them uh, the IHT point that the EIS is qualify for BPR, however, the VCT will not. And the most important point will be the income tax that the dividends on the shares of EIS will be taxable, but the dividends on VCT will be exempt. That's it. That is ample for five marks. So out of 25, I can take five marks if I have a good knowledge of the investment schemes, the efficient investment schemes. Now, before we start solving the other two requirements, I would like you to raise your hands, please. That if you have understood the requirement till now. Okay, any questions till now? If anyone has any questions. Okay, now let's talk about the other parts. I'll open again the email from manager just to quickly look what I have to do. So firstly to requirement A, to the first bit relates to calculation of the income tax saving which would be achieved in a complete tax year if D were to follow the friend's advice. And the friend advice was that the money should be split in one third and two third. So 150 with D, sorry, 150 with CAM and 300 with D and out of that money the further split should be that both of them should invest one third of their money into cash deposit and two third of their money into shares now how do I remember that because I have written here 150k to cam one third into cash and two third into share and 300k to D and the same for that so I do not have to go through the requirements again because I've written my uh, review point on the scratch pad. So I'll open the spreadsheet here. Along with that, I'll open the question and I'll start extracting the data from the question. Now. I'll start with requirement A. I'll bold it so examiner can clearly see that this part relates to requirement A. And these are the tax savings. Okay, these are the tax savings. I know that in one option, it told me in the question that if D invest 100%, if D invest Uh, sorry guys, it's a bit slow the work response. It does not work as fast as our normal spreadsheet Okay, so if D invest 100% it, it is mentioned in the question. I've written in my scratch pad 302 K Sorry, I'm unable to scroll down my scratch pad. There is a lag sometime between to use the practice platform. So bear with me, please. Uh, 
guys do remember all of the work that you do if it gets stuck for example let's say in my case it gets stuck all of your work will be saved even if i cross it even if i refresh the page even if i go out of the browser whenever i log in all of my work my scratch pad or my spreadsheet will be saved okay so don't worry if you know you are practicing a question and it gets stuck to remember that okay so these are the options 4485 for first option i have clearly written here so 4485 for the first option however for second option if d invest 300 and i'll put a space between them if cam invest 150000 because that's what their friend's plan was who is tax advisor as well so now for them i'll do my working below and the working will be that the amount of money d has so i'll write d here so the money that d will be investing in shares and cash so for shares it will be one third of sorry for shares it is two third for cash it is one third Two third of the three hundred thousand, and what is that? Two hundred thousand, and one third she'll be investing. in the cash that is 100000 now i know that the return on cash was 1% and on shares it was 4% so on cash it's 1% on And on cash, it's and on its shares, it's four percent. I can here write the income. It will be this times four percent. this times one percent eight thousand and one thousand okay so these are the incomes now let's copy this and i'll change that's for cam guys did you get it why i copied it to teach you that this is how you will save the time as well you won't be typing again and again all of the performer raise your hand if you have acknowledged that quick 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 raise your hands thank you so now i'll just only change the figures here in that in his case it is 150 here and 150 here as well and the formulas are there so in formula i'll just share the value so 150 here and 150 here so it's 100 000 and 
50,000 and what will be the return? 4,500 so now I have the incomes as well that what they'll be earning Now all I have to do is I have to apply the tax so I can make a separate column here for the tax I could have applied straight away the rate but the problem is that one income is cash income and one income is dividend income so the rates for the cash and the dividend income varies on cash the rate of savings that is 20 40 45 percent applies however on cash the uh, on the shares the rate of dividend applies that is 7.5 percent 32.5 percent and 38.1 percent guys you remember from the question that d was additional rate band pair so i shall apply 38.1 percent with her shares income to calculate the tax it's 3048 but you tell me that when i was calculating when i was studying the isa part i've asked you guys that will she be entitled to the 2000 nil rate band and you said yes but guys she's additional rate band pair is the 2000 nil rate band available to additional rate band pairs or is it only available for basic and higher rate band pairs quick 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 answer me in the question section it is only available for it is not only available for basic and higher it is available for all the band pays for dividend there is no restriction regardless of what your band is you will be entitled to 2000 anyways so do remember that here on first 2000 there will be no tax so i shall apply my tax on 6000 so rather than selecting the cell i'll here select 6000 so 2286 will be the correct amount and on cash obviously because she is a high rate band pair so the tax rate will be 45 percent so this times 45 percent 450 okay now let's talk about cam obviously for cam 2000 will be taxed at zero percent and the remaining 2000 will be taxed at which band you remember guys which band pair is cam is come on guys i'll be needing your participation basic rate band okay not the higher one because you've seen his income were as low as 18,000 in the question. So he's a basic red band pair. So the remaining 2000 will fall into 7.5%. So I'll write here 2000 into 7.5%. I have to apply equals to as well. 150. Sorry, I'll copy this formula rather here yes now here on the savings income what tax rate will be applied 20 percent but the problem is that for the basic rate band pair and for the high rate band pair the first 1000 income and first 500 income of basic rate of savings income gets taxed at 0%. So even if he is a high rate band pair or a basic rate band pair, his income is way below 500. So I guess he will be able to get away with any tax. So no tax. You can multiply it by 0% just to show your examiner that there will be no tax so now i can calculate the sum here by applying the sum formula quickly that what is the amount of total tax so 2736 plus 150 it's 2886 what shall i do i shall go up 
and I can write here that if cam invests the amount of tax Or I can apply some formula separately as well here. I can do this plus this And same I can do here I can copy the formula and paste here it will automatically pick up that I want to add up the both cells. I do not have to put formula again. So here I'll mention equals to this. This is the income of D and this is the CAMS income. So there you can see. I can now check the savings. That will be this minus this and this. If the answer is positive, it means there'll be tax savings of 1599. So, guys, this was the most crucial part. If you were solving the question, let me tell you for which points you should give yourself the margin. Let's say if I was the student and I was solving it for the first time, I may forgot that. I have to save the 2000 pound dividend yield rate band. I would have straight away applied it for 38.1%. That is not a big deal. Okay, the examiner will spare you or only deduct 1.5 mark for that. Let's say I might have forgot that when I was calculating the tax on the cash, that there was a 500 savings nil rate band available. Doesn't really matter. You should give your margin yourself that you might have made that mistake. So I always told my students and I told you guys yesterday as well. Your target should not be to match the answer exact with the exam certain answer. No, that should not be your target. All you should check while reading the answers of the question. That how much steps have you correctly solved? I am telling you one harsh reality. The exam day will come and there will be hardly any question for which You'll be solving yourself and your answer will be exactly the same from the solution. This is how the tax is. It is very difficult to produce the exact answer. Even if you are not sitting in exam standard conditions. So how do you expect? So what do you think guys all of the students including me or everyone that has came through that process and passed the paper? Was this paper 100% correct? No, obviously not. You only need 50% of the paper you have attempted to be correct in order to pass. So you should be realistic. All you should focus is as to how many steps you can correctly solve. And what I do, I always roam around in the paper and look for the easy marks. For example, I have seen that there were easy marks without nitty gritties for the last part. I can easily score five marks by writing the comparison there. I'll be preferring that and I'll try to score maximum marks from the part that includes the tricky calculations or the tricky concepts rather i'll focus on the parts on which by straightforward application of concepts i can take marks so guys have you understood what i'm trying to say raise your hands please quick quick more hands Okay, now coming back, I have calculated and told the examiner about the very first part of the first requirement. However, still some parts are unsolved. So I have to open the detailed requirement. I've done this calculation. Okay, I have assumed to do efficiently. This part has been done. This this first part has been done till here. Now, what is the second part? It seems to me that the total income tax liability of D and CAM could be reduced further. Yes, I remember the manager management was uh, the manager was saying to me that I think that rather than two third or one third, what other combination you think would be suitable? So I will suggest them that rather than D keeping the major part of the proceeds from the inherited homes or inherited fund. CAM should rather keep the high amount of percentage. 
Now these are the things Rubina and other students that are confused. You'll be writing in word processor. All you have to do is you come here, give the reference that that is part A, and start writing underneath that. I'll suggest that more portion of proceeds shall be transferred to Cam as he is a lower tax band pair. Or I could have said that another better basis of distribution should be that D shall invest in cash from her proceeds from her part of proceeds as they have a low return so the tax will be lower and cam shall invest more in shares as they have a higher return of 4% but cam tax rate is lower than D okay so in my opinion what I'll suggest them you can write in your language but what I'll suggest them is that what they should do is because cam is a lower rate taxpayer and D is a higher rate taxpayer she shall invest she shall transfer her or him sorry to the higher amount of chunk of the money and rather than they both investing in shares and cash D shall invest more in cash and cam should invest more in shares because cash has a very low rate of return 1% so the income will be lower so even if uh, D has to pay at a higher rate but the income will be lower so the tax will be lower the as far as the shares are concerned they have a higher rate of 4% so I'll suggest that cam should invest in the shares okay guys any issues Any questions till now? Okay. Again, guys, I'm telling you mindset mindset and mindset what matters the most in your exam you don't have to be super expert in taxation rules what you need to have is a strong mindset and a good exam technique with a reasonable amount of knowledge of the tax rules okay obviously if you do not have the knowledge your mindset and your you know confidence or technique is of no use so you have to have knowledge as well now Again, I have to open the requirement and to see that whether I have, you know, answered all parts. So yes, this bit is done as well. Now this bit is left. The matters to be considered in relation to the income tax in respect of the proposed gift to order. So guys, I have already told you that it is a cash gift, and because of that cash gift, it is, it will not be subject to CGT. However, it will subject to IHT, but let me open the question once more and see that where I have given the information about order. So if you remember the age of order is 16 years old, so he's a minor. He's not an adult. So here I want to tell you a rule regarding the income of a minor. If you transfer as a parent something to your children that are under 18 and that are considered to be minor not adult if the income is below 
hundred pound per annum, then they it will be considered as their income. If the income is above hundred pound per annum, it will not be considered the income of the child. It will rather be considered as the income of the parent. Now, guys, you tell me first one thing in yes or no. Will it be considered as an income of order? He is going to gift her. He or she is going to gift him 20,000 pounds and 1% is the rate of interest. So do you think that it will cross 100 pound or not? Answer me in yes or no. Will it cross 100 pounds? Thank you, Bella. Not his income because it will be crossing the 100 benchmark. So it will be considered as the income of D and I will not suggest D to do this because she's already an additional band pair. She might have to pay 45% tax on this interest that actually will be received by order. But because he's a minor, he's not an adult. It will be considered the income of a parent. So I hope this will help you to learn that rule. Now. In part A, I have answered everything. The part C, I have I had answered already. So let's get back. Gift to Cam. So that I have done as, as well. That what is the residency status of Cam as far as the IHT is concerned? So we have covered that as well. So guys before starting the next question we will take a five minutes break and then we'll start. Rather I guess let's take a 10 minute break because we haven't taken any break since the start of the webinar. So let's take a 10 minute break. You can post your questions in the question section. I'll answer them after the break. Bella, the next question is Plaid and Quill Limited. It is a 25 mark question. It is from March June 19 attempt. Rubina, the best way to manage your time is rather reduce quality and increase the quantity of your answers. What does that, what do I mean by that? Whenever we try to produce a very quality answer, an answer of a high quality, it always takes time. And I always tell students that if you produce a very high quality answer of a 15 mark question, I cannot give you 20 mark out of that. And you might have taken twice the time. Rather, it was better to answer it okay and use your time in some other question. So if you have scored seven marks uh, in an okay question and a 10 mark in an okay question, you could have scored 17 marks rather than having scoring 15 marks and wasting time on one question. So do not overemphasize in quality while solving the paper. Try to solve them with the best of your ability, but within the given time. Even if you think that it is not up to the mark, just leave it and move on. Try to do as many as questions as you can while you are sitting in the paper. That should be your approach while studying and practicing at home as well.
<clears throat> okay students let's start again and as i told you that our next question is march june 19 attempt plaid and quill limited can also be found on the <coughs> practice platform as in the past paper updated to the finance act and it can also be found in the kaplan skate as well so let's open the past paper I'll start the June 19 past paper. In the start, it will give you some instructions which will be also available in the live exam as well. Once you're done with that, now you can see the question. As it is a 25 mark question, so obviously it is a question number two. Now, here you can see the requirements. Before I start, I would like all of you to raise your hands to give me a go ahead. Okay, guys, let's start. Your manager has sent you a schedule prepared by the Claire Faulkner concerning her company, Plaid Limited, a new limit, new company. Quill Limited, which she intends to incorporate on 1st July. So, Plaid are concerning her company, Plaid Limited, and a new company, Quill Limited. So, Plaid might be his old company or her old company, and Quill may be her new company. So, this covering email from your manager details the work he requires to do the two documents are set out in the exhibits the following ex exhibits available on the left hand side of the screen provide the information relevant to the question okay attachment scheduled from Claire Faulkner dated 7 June 2021 and extract an email from my manager that is in June 2021 obviously in the detail email of my manager there'll be the breakup of the requirements the information should be used to answer the question requirements within your cho chosen response options chosen response option means that it is my discretion that for which part i want to use the word processor and for which part i want to use spreadsheet now before i move on if anybody has any question they can ask Okay, now let's read the requirement first. These are only the split of marking scheme. So the biggest chunk deals to the requirement A, that is 18 marks, group relief. So group relief means well, what I normally call them as a 75% loss relief group, that if one company owns another company directly, then the direct ownership should be more than 75%. And if indirectly, then the effective holding should also be 75%. If that is the case, then both of the company can form a loss relief group, which is also called as a group relief. Now, what are the advantages of group relief? If the companies forms a group relief, then they can share all of their losses or all types of their losses with each other. For example, if one company has faced trading loss, they can share their trading loss with the other company which will then set off the losses against his profits or its profits and will be able to save the corporation tax on that now another advantage is that if you receive or uh, suffers a loss on chargeable gains for example instead you have realized a capital loss you can share your capital losses as well but for that there's a separate group that you have to form called 75% gain group for that direct holding should be 75% and effective holding should be 50% I can take you to my notes 
and tell you that where all of this is mentioned in there there's a separate chapter for corporation tax there you can see and in there you can see 75 percent loss relief group and 75 percent gain group so this is the loss relief group and if you form the loss relief these are the types of losses that you can share interest deficits property business loss trading loss and unrelieved qcds qcds means charities if the company has not enough profit so that they can deduct any charities that they have made what they can do is they can transfer their charities to their other group member which have sufficient amount of profit to set off and this way the charities will not go wasted for the group so these are certain advantages that i should keep in mind before reading the question coming back to the question second is related to group registration for value added tax purposes for two marks i'll be concerned to answer this requirement first because it is a very easy requirement for two marks i might be able to answer it in isolation without reading or getting into the nitty gritties of the scenario the third one plaid limited unreported chargeable gain unreported chargeable gain tells me that this must be that five mark part that i have i have been ex expecting that will come from the ethics now guys just to tell you that i have constantly told you that there will be a five mark part if i take you to question number one of this attempt just for the sake of telling you that ethics question you can see that 35 mark of this question does not have any requirement that deals with ethics gift to shares gift of investment property providing financial instances josh monthly cash gift and another way of telling is that there is no requirement of five marks ethics cannot come more than five marks and cannot usually gets tested less than five marks they are tested for five marks so there is no five part requirement mark uh, uh, five marks requirement in question number a so in question number b i can uh, sorry in question number two in section a i can clearly see a five mark requirement it means it must have been tested from the chargeable gain so i'll be more concerned with in scoring seven marks out of 25 in this question by answering these two parts because obviously if the group relief is being tested for 18 marks it must have some tough calculations okay so in which many points i may miss so my focus should be on this so rubina if i'll be doing the question i'll answer part c first then b and in the end i'll try to answer part a so let's look at the email from the manager which will be providing the breakup Tarik, you have said a uh, admin cost is reduced what do you mean by that oh for you are talking about the group relief that the admin cost is no not necessarily because two companies will be working separately and if you are taking services from consultant they'll be charging you for two separate companies so not necessarily the admin cost gets saved but in cert certain circumstances it may get saved so coming back to the email of the manager in which i can find detailed requirements i will first try to read part b and c explain any additional matters of which clear should be aware in relation to group registration for VAT purposes okay c explain the implications for plaid limited and for our firm so i'll make two requirements for plaid limited and for our firm so two headings should be in your answer plaid limited and our firm and then you have to tell the consequences the failure to report the chargeable gains to hmrc you should not address money laundering or the possibility of, of penalties as i have already spoken to clear about these matters okay so i sh i shall only discuss about the non-disclosure of income or gain i'll take you to my notes where i have a separate section for ethics you must learn it by heart so that you can score five easy marks you it can be found at the end of the income tax chapter there i have told you that the ethics can be tested in five ways issues relating to new clients issues relating to conflict of interest for example if we are acting for two clients that both are competitors as well and hmrc errors and mistakes for example hmrc has mistakenly 
provided you the more refund or provided you the more uh, more grant or something which because obviously hmrc can make some errors as well if in that is the case it is our legal responsibility to tell hmrc that you have made an error so please correct your error so that can be ethical issues tax avoidance or evasion my client may be involved in either avoiding the tax or evasion evading the tax money laundering my client might be involved in money laundering what i have to do in all of these scenarios you can read under the instructions now also there is a section called for gaar gar general anti abusive rules these are the rules that hmrc have made whenever hmrc find out some trick of a taxpayers which hmrc is unaware of hmrc then comes up with an anti avoidance rules so that in future people cannot use that trick but for that person hmrc applies the gaar rules what does that mean hmrc assumes that the in the absence of that trick what would have been the income of that person or the company and what would have been the tax and then they make you pay that tax so you have to pay the excessive tax so this is what gaar use that uh, study that as well because i have seen two attempts in the recent past in which i have seen that this has been tested straight away for five marks and the requirement was uh, manager is saying that he is unaware of the gaar if i can search on that and tell him that what it is and i could have scored five easy marks if i know the gaar okay now coming back what do i have to do in this requirement whenever there is a matter let me zoom the question for you guys guys please tell me in the question section whenever you think that the question is not visible so i can zoom it for you okay i hope it is now visible raise your hands if you think the visibility is okay for the question okay guys now whenever whenever there is a thing that your client is trying to hide from hmrc there is standard instructions that you have to write you first will try to convince the client that they should tell this to hmrc unreported chargeable gain tells me that they are maybe trying to hide some chargeable gain from hmrc so I'll first convince them that they should tell the hmrc because otherwise it is a criminal offense if they do not i'll try to tell them the fines and penalties if they still no do not agrees to disclose or do the right thing i'll stop acting for them as a consultant and i will inform hmrc that i have stopped acted acting for them as a consultant however please 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 remember that you have to always write that i will not tell hmrc the reasons why i have resigned this is a rule to protect the confidentiality you can never tell the reason to hmrc tipping hmrc off is ample if somebody tells hm if uh, you know any consultant or firm tells hmrc that you know we have stopped working for this client it automatically alerts hmrc that something you know fishy is happening so there is no need to tell because it is a rule whenever there is such thing the standard procedures are i'll try to convince the client to do the right thing if they do not agree i'll try to tell them that it can result in fines and penalties and it is a criminal offense if they still don't agree i'll stop acting for them and i'll inform the hmrc but i will not tell the reason that's it okay by stating these you can easily score five marks now let's talk about group vat registration what normally happens is that if you register all of your companies as a group for vat purposes you have to submit only one vat return for all of the companies and one company can be held responsible for submitting the vat returns to hmrc the second good thing is that if the companies 
does any intra-group sales they do not have to charge output or input VAT to each other but I here have to tell some additional matters so I have to read the question first and see that out of that what are the points that Claire already knows and what are the points that I have to tell her so let's read the question guys I haven't gone through the requirement a in detail because there is no point before studying the question I will not be able to understand it anyways. However, I will read the headings first that directly deal to requirement C in isolation. It will save my time. I am again telling you guys. These are the techniques you keep asking me. Sir, how can I save time? I always ran out of time. These are the techniques. Do the parts first that you can do in isolation without getting into nitty gritties of the question. Okay, because the most ex, uh, time intensive questions are question A and B. So, unreported gains, I have just discovered that a chargeable gain of 21,600 realized by P Limited in the year ended 30th June 2017 was omitted from its corporation tax return. However, because of the gain arose in respect of the sale of the land, it was reported for the purposes of stamp duty land tax. So they have informed HMRC, but only for the purpose of stamp duty land tax. They have not paid corporation tax on their gain. Accordingly, I assume we do not need to do anything and that HMRC will contact us about this at some point. No, guys, the understanding of the manager is completely wrong. We have to tell them the company, the Plaid and Quill Limited or the Clare that this needs to be reported to HMRC immediately and they must pay any they must pay any due corporation tax on that. Otherwise, it will be considered as a tax evasion, which is the criminal offense. And HMRC may charge them the penalty as well. You can see that in, in, in my notes, in the omissions, I have clearly written that. HMRC omissions and tax irregularities. They must discuss it with the client, ensure the proper disclosure is made, not declaring income that is taxable, these are the types of non examples that I've given that normally gets tested. The client is not either declaring the income, claiming the reliefs that he's not entitled to or not notifying HMRC. What do we have to do? Where the client made an error, it will be necessary to decide whether it was a genuine mistake. Once the error has been discovered, we should explain it to the client. If the client still refuses to make, cease to act for the client, write to HMRC, but do not, don't disclose the reasons. Okay. So you read that by heart. It will help you to score five easy marks. So part C done. Let's talk about part B value added tax. I would like to I would like the two companies to register as a group for VAT purposes to avoid the need to charge VAT on intra group supplies and to generally reduce administration. Now Tariq be careful. Claire already knows these two advantages, so I'll not be scoring any marks by telling her this again. Because she already already knows that that by forming a VAT group, she'll be able to save admin cost and she will not have to charge any intra group VAT. And for Plaid for the group to continue to use the annual accounting scheme currently used by Plaid Limited. I appreciate this would mean that the two companies would be jointly severely liable for the group's VAT liability. So she also know that that both of the companies will be liable for the VAT liability. So I will ask you guys if the group will be formed, will the company be able to join the annual accounting scheme? The annual accounting scheme is a VAT scheme as you guys know. Good answer guys. The answer is no. If you form a VAT group, you will not be allowed to join annual accounting scheme. So this is the only matter I think that the Claire is unaware of. Otherwise, she knows 
that what are the other advantages and I guess for two marks th this can only be the point. However, if there will be any while I'll be reading the question, I can always come back and add my point in that answer. So let's go back and read the question from the start. I have owned the whole of the ordinary share capital. That's what Claire is telling us. I have owned the whole of the ordinary share capital of P Limited since 2006. P Limited trades mainly in UK and is the UK resident company. It purchases components from the third parties to be assembled into the finished products. It has also a permanent establishment in the country of Chika. The profits realized in C are subject to 14%. C is business tax. There is no double taxation treaty between the UK and the country of C. Guys, you tell me which statement is correct the first one or the second one the dtrs is available when there is no double taxation treaty this is the first statement or the dtr is available when there is double taxation treaty between the countries first or second one quick guys which statement is correct The first one is correct. Thanks Bella. If there is no double taxation treaty, it means that you will be taxed twice. So only in that case you will receive the double taxation relief by the HMRC. If there is a double taxation treaty of HMRC with that country, you will not be taxed twice. So what is the point of you getting the tax relief then? You're not getting twice tax twice you either be taxed in the UK or you'll either be taxed in that country depending upon what kind of a treaty HMRC has so in that case there is no treaty with that country of C it means that Claire must have been taxed in the country of C and in UK as well okay now getting back the budgeted Taxable profits of P for the year ended 30th June 2020 are set out below. P Limited's profitability is very stable. So please assume that these figures will following year the same. It means that in the next year, it will be the same profit that P Limited will be making. Same profits. Okay. So the trading profit in UK is 14,000. And before the deduction, the Profits from country of C is 7,000, so it's 55,000. The total profits are 55,000. That's fine. For Q Limited, Q Limited will be incorporated, registered for the VAT and commence trading from 1st July 2021. It will trade in the UK and be a UK resident company. That's fine. From a commercial standpoint, my intention was to own Q Limited personally. However, if there is a sufficient tax advantage, I will consider establishing the company as a wholly owned subsidiary of Plaid Limited. I'll stop here, guys, and I'll tell Claire that she might know many things about VAT Group, but here she's wrong. She do not know that if she owns the company personally, what would be the disadvantage? Can anybody tell me in the question section? Myra, to answer to your question, the lecture is recorded. So once you'll get back to home, after 24 hours, the recording will be available. And so are my notes that will be uploaded at the ACCS website as well. Yes, guys, what will be the disadvantage? Guys, if Claire will own the two companies separately herself, they will not be able to form the group. So do remember in order to form that 75% loss relief group. The company should be owned by a company and then Claire can own the parent company. The Claire can 
own the parent company that is P limited P limited can then own Q limited so in this way P and Q will be able to form the group now the first two ways of budgeted results of Q limited are set out below to remember these are the budgeted results because the company is not yet even incorporated the trading profit and loss figures before the deduction of capital allowances. Okay, so the capital allowances are not being deducted from this. But have otherwise been adjusted for the purposes of corporation tax. The chargeable gain will not qualify for rollover relief. Okay, so which chargeable gain? I guess she is talking about this chargeable gain. Here ending 30 June 2022, that will be the first year of Q Limited. She will face it will face a loss 10,500 Okay Then Year ending 30th June 2023 It will Become profitable that's strange that you know making that much of a profit in the first year, but it's a question It can happen here Okay, so I'll highlight that On 1st July 2021 Q limited following purchase the following capital asset. So before I read the question further, let's open my scratch pad and write few points here, which I have studied or observed till now. The first is that P limited is old company, 100% owned. Q limited is new company loss to Q in first year and profit in second I'll write for my observation that if form group can share loss with P Obviously, if Q Limited can form a group with P Limited, it can surrender its loss to the P Limited if provided that P Limited has the profits. Now, on 1st July 2021, Q Limited will purchase the following assets machinery and equipment, building used for machinery, manufacturing, and storage. So, guys, I'll stop here. The profits or the losses that are mentioned above are before the deduction of capital ounces. That's fine that the profit the Q Limited will be making in 2023, the capital, whatever capital ounces, they will be deducted from that profit and the profit will be reduced. What about the losses, guys? If I add or adjust the capital losses, what will happen to the losses? Will they increase or decrease? Guys, will the losses increase after deducting the capital allowances? Yes, losses will be increased. Okay, because normally when you deduct the capital allowances from your profits, it helps you to decrease your profit. Here, you are already, you know, making loss or suffering loss. So deducting the capital allowances, they will increase your loss. But I have to calculate the capital allowances myself because the profits or the losses above are before capital allowances. So I'll write there in my scratch pad that calculate capital allowances for Q limited before calculating loss. To help me remember now. On machinery and equipment, I can see that it will qualify for AIA. Building used for machine manufacturing and stop. Is there any allowance that can qualify for buildings? Does it ring any bell, guys? Any specific allowance? Great, Ashik, it's SBA. 
that is structures and building allowance no rubina there's a new launch announced by hmrc in this finance sec that is finance sec 2020 that is structures and buildings allowance in that you can claim the depreciation or the capital allowances on buildings as well but on the value of the building if the building has any equipment in that it should be treated separately and that will qualify for aia not for the sba so what is the rate of sba the rate of sba is three percent straight line so every year the answer will be the same because you'll keep multiplying three percent with the cost of the building okay so do remember that i'll write on my pad as well sba on building three percent aia on plant now the cost of the building includes 60000 for land 300000 for construction and 1040 in respect of thermal insulation and air conditioning equipment in order to create the appropriate conditions for manufacturing once completed the building will be brought into use on 1st january 2020 now guys there are two important points here first that in the cost of the building there is a cost of plant and machinery included secondly the building will become usable during the year it is not available from the start of the year so first of all i would ask the question that will i be taking complete three percent in the first year or will i have to time a portion that quick answers time a portion or full thank you ashik and rubina i will time a bit a portion and my year end is in the question my year end is 30th june so i have started to use it from 1st january so obviously the time apportionment will be 6 by 12. okay now second thing is will the cost of 1040 be included while calculating calculating the spa or do i have to deduct 1040 from 1.4 million deduct or include tell me come on guys quick answers no juliet that's wrong i've just told you that the plant and machinery that are included in the building they cannot qualify for sba it should only be the building the plant and machinery will qualify for aia so i will separate the amount of plant and machinery and then that amount will qualify for aia however remaining amount will qualify for sba okay so i'll quickly calculate here and write on my scratch pad as well that out of 14 million i'll i can take three zeros common one zero four zero three sixty is the value of the building so i can write on my scratch pad into 360k times a portion by 6 by 12 so i can remember and on aia 1040k is available for aia but these are the items that are integrated into building the items that are integrated into building are after getting aia gets into the special rate pool a pool where after getting aia any remaining amount will get six percent depreciation or the capital loans on reducing balance method from now onward if it would have been a normal plant and machinery that is not integrated into the building then it would have qualified for wda 18 percent and uh, any amount that is above the aia limit would have qualified for wda 18 percent on a reducing balance method so that is the point you have to remember as well that after aia transfer to 
special rate pool SRP. Now coming back to the question. I'll keep making my notes. So I do not have to come back and read the scenario thoroughly that part relates to VAT, and then this part relates to chargeable gain. So I guess I'm done with the scenario. Now I can read the detailed requirement of extract from email of manager for first part in order to help Claire make a decision on her ownership of Q limited by advisor the tax advantage of Q limited being wholly owned subsidiary of P limited such that the two companies form a group relief. You should carry out this work in three stages. So now to answer this requirement, I have to answer three things. Explain with supporting calculations the maximum amount of group relief which P limited would need to receive for the year ended 30th June. Such that none of its double taxation relief in respect of CK would be wasted and its UK tax payable would be nil. You should assume the rate of CT is 19% for all accounting periods. Now guys, this is the very common requirement in real life of the clients as well. You know whenever I talk to a client their first demand or requirement is that is there any possibility that the tax can be reduced to nil and without wasting any reliefs or exemptions available is there any possibility so now in the question you can see that the clear is demanding the same what clear is demanding clear is saying that i have seen that around 55000 is the total profit of p limited roughly and she's about to receive a DTR as well. She wants to see or she wants us to calculate the exact amount of loss that if she'll made up a group with Q limited, she claims from Q limited that her DTR not gets wasted. However, it will result in zero corporation tax after deducting the DTR. So now for that, I have to reverse calculate and I'll share with you. How will I do that? However in the second requirement prepare calculations of the CT liabilities of the two companies for two years. So for both company. I have to calculate the tax liability for two years. Your calculation should be on the basis that the trading loss of Q limited will be used. As soon as possible list restricting the amount of group relief in accounting period to the maximum figure you calculated in part a okay so i shall assume that whatever the loss that i have calculated in part a after taking account of that i shall calculate the liability or the corporation tax liability of both companies secondly if there is any remaining loss even after surrendering to the p limited in the first year the remaining loss should be relieved as soon as possible now if you remember in yesterday's lecture i have told you that whenever the client says as soon as possible carry forward is his last option the good options to consider them is if there is a group then try to surrender to the group companies that are making profit or set up against your total incomes if you have other sources of income these are the key sources okay now thirdly Conclude by explaining that tax advantage of Q limited becoming a wholly owned subsidiary of P limited as opposed to being owned personally by Claire. Obviously the advantage is that whatever the loss I will be calculating. It will be saving the corporation tax for both companies which the Claire would otherwise to pay separately. So what I, if even if I calculate the loss wrongly. If I conclude that this is the benefit, I'll get full marks for this third requirement. While carrying out this work, I should be aware of that the year ending 30, 30 June 2022, the AIA will be available to Q Limited and Q Limited will claim maximum capital allowances available. Okay, neither of the two companies will be required to pay corporation tax in quarterly installment. That's fine. Now, why he has telling me this point? Because what happens is if you form a group of companies. Rather than having separate AIA available for each and every company, you now have only one AIA available. For the whole group. So if Q limited will become member with P limited as a 75% relief group member, 
there is only one AIA available. So now my manager has asked me to assume that that complete AIA limit of 1 million will be available to Q limited and none will be available to other company that is P limited and I haven't seen any purchase of the asset by P limited as well. So even if he would not have mentioned that I would have given the complete AIA to Q limited. Now. Let's start working with requirement number A. How much loss can I claim so that the liability can be calculated as zero? That's fine. I'll open the spreadsheet now. The question we can keep on the right part, left part, and the spreadsheet on the left. Now, first of all, we have to calculate the loss that has been made or that has been suffered by the Q Limited. So I'll start with, I'll tell examiner that I'm going to start part A. And in that I'm calculating loss of Q limited first. So now I know that loss before CA stands for capital ounces is given in the question. So let's close the requirement and open the scenario. It's 10,500. So 10,500 is the loss. Now, add capital ounces. For that, I have to open a working. Let's name it working number one to check that what are the capital ounces says let's open working one here now first of all i'll be making columns that is wda or rather i'll make it general pool rather than calling it WDA at 618%. Then there's a special rate pool. I'll name it SRP. And then there's a column called allowances. Now, I'll see that for every asset which in which column shall it go. So first it has bought machinery equipment. Machinery shall go into general pool 160,000. Then we have bought building. So for building, we, there is no need to calculate allowance in the allowance column. We can straight away take 3% afterwards. So I'll skip building for the time being. I have Thermal insulation, so I can take thermal insulation. Now, for that, I have already calculated, or it's given to me in the question that their cost is 1040. So, thermal insulation, because it is integrated into land and building, qualifies for SRP. Now, I can deduct the AIA that is available. But I want to ask you guys to answer me in the question section that from where the IA, AIA will be deducted first SRP or the general pool because the limit is 1 million and I have the asset more than 1 million. From SRP. Or the AIA. Ashik the lands gets qualified for SBA. I will be calculating SBA later on. Currently, I have just taken the part of thermal insulation which does not belong to the cost of the building. 
Thank you, Ashik. You are right. No, Ashik, you are wrong. G general pool is wrong. Fawad and Rubina, you are right. Special rate pool. Because at special rate pool, if the AIA is not given to the asset, they will later be depreciated at a slower rate. That is 6%. However, even if the general pool assets will not get the AIA this time, they will later on will be depreciate quickly as HMRC gives WDA or the depreciation at 18% to general pool items. So AIA should always be preferred first for the SRP items then for the general pool items. So I'll deduct AIA from here. That is 1 million. Now I'll transfer 1 million into allowances as well. Now I will less. Sorry. WDA. At 18 slash 6%. So obviously, I can multiply straight away this times 18%. And for that, I first have to calculate how much amount is left. So this plus this, what is left? So I can multiply this times 6% and here I can add all of these allowances as a total. Now I can calculate the carry forward balance for the next year. It will be this minus this. That is the carry forward balance. As I have to calculate the profit for both years for both companies, which means that I must have to calculate the profit for Q Limited for both years as well. So let's quickly calculate for 30th June 2022 as well. And there is no extra calculation except I'll just copy this here. And because no new asset has been purchased in that year, on the closing balance, I'll apply the appropriate percentages that is 18% on the closing balance of general pool and I can copy this formula and then I can edit that it is not 18%. It's rather 6%. And then this formula can be copy here, which will add both. Okay, guys, so I'm done with the capital ounces for two years. For the second year, this is the amount I can bold. However, for the first year, the total allowances are 1 million plus this. Now, loss of Q Limited, and that is for 30th June 2021. Before capital ounces, it was this amount, and the capital ounces are this. So, total loss will be this plus this total loss. Now I know that what is the loss of Q limited for the year. Now the next step is to figure out how much loss shall it surrender to Q limited so that Q limited uh, sorry P limited so that its tax liability will become zero without losing the advantage of the double taxation relief. So I'll stop here. And I'll request all of you to raise your hand if you have understood till now. Thank you. Now. With that, I've also calculated the 
corporation tax liability for for one year for Q limited as well because there is no profit. So there will be no. Corporation tax liability that's total loss. OK, guys, so let's go and calculate for 30th June 2021. P limited. Now their profits are mentioned into into the question that is 55,000. So profits. Are. 55,000. Now. What I want to calculate is that how much profits shall be left that from them when I deduct the double taxation relief they will become zero. So it is easier just to calculate the double taxation relief the profit that I shall left be with should be equal to double taxation relief. For example, let's say if the double taxation relief is 100. If I have the profits left after deducting the losses of 100, I'll deduct the 100 as a DTR and then the profits will become zero. So let's first calculate that. What is the amount of DTR? The profits are 7000. And there is a tax of 14%. 980. So the DTR is normally the lower of tax that you have suffered in overseas country on the profits as compared to the UK. So it is obvious that the overseas tax will be lower because for UK tax I have to multiply 7000 by 19% which is a higher rate. So it is obvious that that lower rate will be the tax in the country of C. So if I left with. Profits of 980. Only then I'll my. DTR will not get wasted and my tax liability was will be nil. Now. For 980,000. Uh, sorry for the profit of 980 only left. How much profit shall be available? That on which if I apply 19% the answer will be exactly 980. How much profits shall there be? That for which when I apply 19% on them the answer should be exactly. 980 it is pretty easy guys just take 980 and consider that it is 19% so multiply uh, divided by 19 and multiply it by 100. Five one five seven or five one five eight you can say so if you have the profit of five one five eight. Let's say five one five eight. And you multiply it by 19%. The tax liability will sorry. Five one five eight. Multiply by 19% 980. So I shall have the profits of 5158. Because from them when I deduct my. DTR my profits or my city liability will become zero. So I will stop here and I want every each and every one of you to raise your hands that you have understood this calculation. Now many of you will be thinking sir come on this is very tough. How can you expect to you know uh, expect us to think like that in the exam conditions? I'll tell you an easy trick with the help of which without thinking like that you can score very good marks and it is. Just use your common sense. Rather than calculating just write. Write that if we have the loss the profits available after deducting the losses that is equivalent to the DTR that is 980. We will be able to reduce the corporation tax liability to zero. That's it. Just mention that so examiner will deduct the mark of the calculation, but will give you the mark of the explanation. So do remember that if you are unable to produce this type of calculation or you are short of time. The easy bit is to provide the explanation using the common sense and score marks for the explanation. 
now moving on so i now know that i shall be left with profits taxable profits of 5158 so when i apply ct at 19% it will be 980 and when i less dtr of exactly 980 my taxable profits will be a zero simple as that now you tell me if i want to keep 5158 of profit how much of loss from q limited shall i request it to surrender to me obviously the balancing figure between 55000 and 5158 so what will be that balancing figure 55000 minus 5158 49842 shall be the amount of losses that if i request q limited to surrender to me the profit my taxable profit will become zero and i do not have to pay any tax liability with that it is always requested to prepare a loss memo loss memo is just the record of loss that how much loss you have utilized and how so my total loss was equals to this this was my total loss less or surrender to p surrender to p was equals to minus i have intentionally put a minus sign so the figure can automatically be converted into negative this so the loss that is left is this plus this nine nine one eight five eight is the loss that is left and i have calculated for the first year the tax liabilities of both for one the tax liability is nil because i have taken the loss and for the second there is no tax liability because there is a huge amount of loss Let's talk about this for the second year. As you know that question states that for P limited, I shall consider that the profits will remain same in the next year. So I will copy this. Here I will edit that it is 22. So these are the profits. Out of that, I'll be I'll check that will there be any losses? If there will be any losses, I will deduct it from here. And the remaining losses, if there will be, they have to be carried forward. Now, guys, here you have to remember a key rule. Next year, the losses of Q Limited cannot be directly surrendered to P Limited because Q Limited itself became profitable in the next year. Here you can see in the question, the Q Limited has 971,000 of profit. So you first have to set up the remaining losses against its own profit first and if if there will be any remaining losses they can be surrendered to p limited so i'll go to loss memo and in loss memo i'll check that how much losses are left the losses are 991858 it means Currently, I can see that there might some losses left after deducting. So let's prepare that computation for P limited for the next year. Now. I'll copy the dates that it is now 30th June rather 
22 i'll write that the profit that the company is making next year is 971000 however there is a chargeable gain as well so that i have to add as well in the company's income and it is 16000 so the total income of the company will be this adds this 987000 out of that i'll deduct loss I can only deduct loss up till 987,000. So minus 987,000. So that it can become zero. It's taxable profits. In the loss memo, I'll write that I have carry forward to 2022 987. So is there any loss left? Yes, the loss of 4858 is left. That I can surrender to my parent company. That is P Limited. So for the next year, P has total profits of 55 like last year. However, I can deduct the losses. And I can press the equals to sign. From the memo, I can copy the figure. Sorry, equals to and I'll press a minus sign. Here I'll put the formula this adds this, that is the taxable income. CT will be at the rate of 19%. So this multiply by 19%. Less DTR as well because next year the DTR will also be available. It will be same 980. So CT payable is this plus this so with that i have now calculated the tax liabilities for both companies for both years and in the second year only p limited has to pay some ct however in first year both companies do not have to pay any corporation tax in the second year only p has to pay some corporation tax now do remember that if you will do this question from Kaplan's kit, the data is little bit different in Kaplan's kit. The amount of strategic business allowance and the machinery included is different from there. So do not compare my answer with the one in the Kaplan examination kit. Do remember for this you can find the stand answer by submitting the exam and clicking on the click here for suggested solution tab. Now guys, as I have summed up, if you guys have any question, I am available. Oh yes, Fawad, you corrected me that I forgot to claim 3% of this uh, SPA allowance. And where do I have to claim that? In both years. Because I have put formulas, I do not have to change all of my working. I can go back into the question where I have calculated the loss for Q limited I can here add a column I can right click or insert the column anyways some more reason it's not allowing me to add it anyways however let me quickly tell you the SBA would have been adjusted after this 3% I would have taken of the amount that I've already noted in my scratch pad. 360 K into 3 by 12. 
So if I calculate with you 360,000 into 3, sorry, 6 by 12. So 6, that is the amount. Nope, this is wrong. Let's calculate again. So the figure is 360,000. So 360,000 times 6 divided by 12. 180,000. First year will take the 3% of this amount. That is 5,400. So first year will take 5,400. However, in the next year, as the building is in use for the complete tax year, I will not time a portion. Rather, I will take complete 3% of 360,000. So 360,000 times 3% in the next year, that is 10,800. So Fawad, have I answered your question? So students, you can see that there are so many steps that even I was under the time pressure that the webinar time is, you know, getting closer to closer. So you'll have the same pressure as well because your exam will be going to end as well. So do remember that it is perfectly fine that you may, you know, forget to solve a vital adjustment, even if you know the concept, but that does not matter. What matters is how much adjustments have I remembered and have solved correctly? You should always focus that the half is glass full rather than focusing that the glass is half empty. And whenever you'll be looking at the solutions, always circle your mistakes. And before going into the question, rather than reading the notes, I'll prefer to read out the answer of your solved question, in which you have highlighted that I have made this mistake and this mistake. It will help you not to make that mistake in the exam. So guys, all of you who find today's session helpful, raise your hands to let me know. That's great. So guys, if you have any question, I'll welcome. Any question guys, you can post them in the question section. Yes, Savad, you can. The here, if you see in, on my screen, the practice platform is not working. Otherwise, if you click here, you always have the option to insert a row. So here it is not showing currently. Otherwise, I would have insert a row and added it. For example, if I open spreadsheet in front of you here, if I want to add a row, I right click here and it shows me an option called insert. I can insert a row and here I can write SBA at 3% and right there. However, your suggestion is absolutely right that if you forgot to write any critical adjustment at the end of the adjustment, you can write that, that the loss will increase much more with the help of SBA allowance that is 3%. And that year it, it will be this and it, that year it will be this. It will be obviously upon the examiner's discretion, but surely he will give you some marks. So guys, I hope that the session you find useful.
tomorrow's topic again tomorrow i have selected to 35 mark questions rather than 25 mark questions so obviously we'll be discussing similar approach as to how to deal with 35 mark questions so stay tuned i'll see you tomorrow till then take care bye